and Bronte was an English novelist and poet, and the youngest member of the Bronte literary family. Anne Bronte was the daughter of Patrick Bronte, a poor Irish clergyman in the Church of England, and lived most of her life with her family at the parish of Howarth on the Yorkshire Moors. Otherwise she attended a boarding school in Murfield between 1836 and 1837, and between 1839 and 1845 lived elsewhere working as a governess. In 1846 she published a book of poems with her sisters and later two novels, initially under the pen name Acton Bell. Her first novel, Agnes Grey, was published in 1847 with Wuthering Heights. Her second novel, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, was published in 1848. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is thought to be one of the first feminist novels. And died at 29, probably of pulmonary tuberculosis. After Anne's death her sister Charlotte edited Agnes Grey to fix issues with its first edition, but prevented republication of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. This is one reason why Anne is not as well known as her sister's. Nonetheless both of Anne's novels are considered classics of English literature. And, from a group portrait by her brother Branwell Anne's father was Patrick Brownie. Patrick Brownie was born in a two-room cottage in Emdale, Laubrickland, County Down, Ireland. He was the oldest of ten children born to Hugh Brunty and Eleanor McCrory, poor Irish peasant farmers. The family surname, Mac A. O. Proenti, was anglicized as Prunty or Brunty. Struggling against poverty, Patrick learned to read and write, and from 1798 taught others. In 1802, at 25, he won a place to study theology at St. John's College, Cambridge. Here he changed his name, Brunty, to the more distinguished-sounding Bronte. In 1807 he was ordained in the priesthood in the Church of England. He served as a curate in Essex and then in Wellington, Shropshire. In 1810 he published his first poem, Winter Evening Thoughts, in a local newspaper. In 1811 he published a collection of moral verse, cottage poems. Also in 1811 he became vicar of Street. Peter's Church in Hartshead, Yorkshire. In 1812 he was appointed an examiner in classics at Woodhouse Grove School, near Bradford. This was a Wesleyan academy where, at 35, he met his future wife, the headmaster's niece, Maria Branwell. Maria Branwell, Anne's mother, was the daughter of Anne Carney, the daughter of a silversmith, and Thomas Branwell, a successful and property-owning grocer and tea merchant in Penzance. Maria was the eleventh of twelve children and enjoyed the benefits of a prosperous family in a small town. After the death of her parents, Maria went to help her aunt with housekeeping functions at the school. Maria was intelligent and well-read, and her strong Methodist faith attracted Patrick Bronte, whose own leanings were similar. Within three months, on December 29, 1812, though from considerably different backgrounds, Patrick Brownie and Maria Branwell were married. Their first child, Maria, was born after they moved to Hartshead. In 1815 Patrick was appointed curate of the chapel in Market Street Thornton, near Bradford. A second daughter, Elizabeth, was born shortly after. Four more children followed, Charlotte, Patrick Branwell, Emily, and Anne. Anne was the youngest of the Brownie children. She was born on January 17, 1820 on the outskirts of Bradford. Her father, Patrick, was curate there. And was baptized there on March 25, 1820. Later Patrick was appointed to the perpetual curacy in Howarth, a small town seven miles away. In April 1820 the family moved into the five-roomed Howarth parsonage. When Anne was barely a year old her mother, Maria, became ill, probably with uterine cancer. Maria Branwell died on September 15, 1821. Patrick tried to remarry, without success. Maria's sister, Elizabeth Branwell, had moved to the parsonage initially for Maria, but spent the rest of her life there raising Maria's children. She did it from a sense of duty. She was stern and expected respect, not love. There was little affection between her and the older children. According to tradition Anne was her favorite. In Elizabeth Gaskell's biography of Charlotte, Patrick remembered Anne as precocious. Patrick said that when Anne was four years old he had asked her what a child most wanted and that she had said, age and experience. In summer 1824 Patrick sent daughters Maria, Elizabeth, Charlotte, and Emily to Crofton Hall in Crofton, West Yorkshire, and subsequently to the clergy daughter's school at Cowan Bridge in Lancashire. Maria and Elizabeth Bronte died of consumption on 6th of May and June 15, 1825 respectively, and Charlotte and Emily were brought home. The unexpected deaths distressed the family so much that Patrick could not face sending them away again. 
They were educated at home for the next five years, largely by Elizabeth Branwell and Patrick. The children made little attempt to mix with others outside the parsonage and relied on each other for company. The bleak moor surrounding Howarth became their playground. And shared a room with her aunt, Elizabeth. They were close, and she may have influenced Anne's personality and religious beliefs. Anne Bronte, by Charlotte Bronte, 1834 Anne's studies at home included music and drawing. The Keithley Church organist gave piano lessons to Anne and Emily and Branwell, and John Bradley of Keithley gave them art lessons. Each drew with some skill. Their aunt tried to teach the girls how to run a household, but they inclined more to literature. They read much from their father's well-stocked library. Their reading included the Bible, Homer, Virgil, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, Scott, articles from Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine and Fraser's Magazine and the Edinburgh Review, and miscellaneous books of history and geography and biography. Their reading fed their imaginations, and their creativity soared after their father gave Branwell a set of toy soldiers in June 1826. They gave names to the soldiers, or the Twelves, and developed their characters. This led to the creation of an imaginary world, the African Kingdom of Angria, which was illustrated with maps and watercolor renderings. The children devised plots about the inhabitants of Angria and its capital city, Glasstown, later called Viriopolis or Verdopolis. Their fantastical worlds and kingdoms gradually acquired characteristics from their historical world, drawing from its sovereigns, armies, heroes, outlaws, fugitives, inns, schools, and publishers. The characters and lands created by the children were given newspapers and magazines and chronicles written in tiny books with writing so small that it was difficult to read without a magnifying glass. These creations and writings were an apprenticeship for their later literary talents. Around 1831, when Anne was 11, she and Emily broke away from Charlotte and Branwell to create and develop their own fantasy world, Gondol. Anne and Emily were particularly close, especially after Charlotte left for Rowhead School in January 1831. Charlotte's friend Ellen Nussie visited Howarth in 1833 and reported that Emily and Anne were like twins and inseparable companions. She described and so, Anne, dear gentle Anne was quite different in appearance from the others, and she was her aunt's favorite. Her hair was a very pretty light brown and fell on her neck in graceful curls. She had lovely violet blue eyes, fine penciled eyebrows and a clear almost transparent complexion. She still pursued her studies and especially her sewing, under the surveillance of her aunt. And took lessons from Charlotte after Charlotte had returned from Rowhead. Charlotte returned to Rowhead as a teacher on July 29, 1835, accompanied by Emily as a pupil. Emily's tuition was largely financed by Charlotte's teaching. Emily was unable to adapt to life at school and was physically ill from homesickness within a few months. She was withdrawn from school by October and replaced by Anne. Anne was 15 and it was her first time away from home. She made few friends at Rowhead. She was quiet and hardworking and determined to stay to acquire the education which she would need to support herself. She stayed for two years and returned home only during Christmas and summer holidays. She won a good conduct medal in December 1836. Charlotte's letters almost never mention Anne while Anne was at Rowhead, which might imply that they were not close, but Charlotte was at least concerned about Anne's health. By December 1837 Anne had become seriously ill with gastritis and embroiled in religious crisis. A Moravian minister was called to see her several times during her illness, suggesting her distress was caused, in part, by conflict with the local Anglican clergy. Charlotte wrote to their father and he brought in home. Blake Hall, illustration, reproduced from photographs taken at the end of 19th century. It was demolished in 1954. A year after leaving the school, and aged 19, Anne was seeking a teaching position. She was the daughter of a poor clergyman and needed to earn money. Her father had no private income and the parsonage would revert to the church on his death. Teaching or working as a governess were among few options for a poor and educated woman. In April 1839 Anne started work as a governess for the Ingham family at Blake Hall, near Murfield. The children in her charge were spoiled and disobedient. And had great difficulty controlling them and little success in educating them. She was not allowed to punish them, and when she complained about their behavior she received no support and was criticized for being incapable. The Inghams were dissatisfied with their children's progress and dismissed Anne. She returned home in 1839 at Christmas. At home also were Charlotte and Emily, who had left their positions, and Branwell. 
Anne's time at Blake Hall was so traumatic that she reproduced it in almost perfect detail in her novel Agnes Grey. Anne returned to Haworth and met William Whiteman, her father's new curate who had started work in the parish in August 1839. Whiteman was 25 and had obtained a two-year licentiate in theology from the University of Durham. He was welcome at the parsonage. Anne's acquaintance with him parallels her writing a number of poems, which may suggest she fell in love with him although there is disagreement over this possibility. Little evidence exists beyond a teasing anecdote of Charlotte's to Ellen Nussie in January 1842. In Agnes Gray Agnes' interest in the curate refreshes her interest in poetry. Outside fiction William Whiteman aroused much curiosity. It seems that he was good-looking and engaging, and that his easy humor and kindness towards the sisters made an impression. It is such a character that she portrays in Edward Weston, and that her heroine Agnes Gray finds deeply appealing. Whiteman died of cholera in the same year. And expressed her grief for his death in her poem I Will Not Mourn Thee, Lovely One, in which she called him Our Darling. Disputed portrait made by Branwell Brandy about 1833. Sources disagree whether this image is of Emily or Anne. From 1840 to 1845 and worked at Thorpe Green Hall, a comfortable country house near York. Here she was governess to the children of the Reverend Edmund Robinson and his wife, Lydia. The house appeared as Horton Lodge in Agnes Gray. And had four pupils, Lydia, Elizabeth, Mary, and Edmund. She initially had problems similar to those at Blake Hall. And missed her home and family. In a diary paper in 1841 she wrote that she did not like her situation and wished to leave it. Her quiet and gentle disposition did not help. But Anne was determined and made a success of her position, becoming well liked by her employers. Her charges, the Robinson girls, became lifelong friends. Anne spent only five or six weeks a year with her family, during holidays at Christmas and in June. The rest of her time was spent with the Robinsons. She accompanied the Robinsons on annual holidays to Scarborough. Between 1840 and 1844 and spent around five weeks each summer at the coastal town and loved it. A number of locations in Scarborough were used for her novels. Anne and her sisters considered setting up a school while she was still working for the Robinsons. Various locations were considered, including the parsonage, but the project never materialized. Anne came home on the death of her aunt in early November 1842 while her sisters were in Brussels. Elizabeth Branwell left a £350 legacy for each of her nieces. It was at the Long Plantation at Thorpe Green in 1842 that Anne wrote her three-verse poem lines composed in a wood on a windy day, which was published in 1846 under the name Acton Bell. In January 1843 Anne returned to Thorpe Green and secured a position for Branwell. He was to tutor Edmund, who was growing too old to be in Anne's care. Branwell did not live in the house as Anne did. Anne's vaunted calm appears to have been the result of hard-fought battles, balancing deeply felt emotions with careful thought, a sense of responsibility and resolute determination. All three Brawny sisters worked as governesses or teachers, and all experienced problems controlling their charges, gaining support from their employers. And coping with homesickness, but Anne was the only one who persevered and made a success of her work. Brawny Parsonage Museum Anne and Branwell taught at Thorpe Green for the next three years. Branwell entered into a secret relationship with his employer's wife, Lydia Robinson. When Anne and Branwell returned home for the holidays in June 1846 Anne resigned. and gave no reason, but the reason may have been the relationship between her brother and Mrs. Robinson. Branwell was dismissed when his employer found out about the relationship. and continued to exchange letters with Elizabeth and Mary Robinson. They came to visit Anne in December 1848 and took Emily to visit some of the places which Anne had become fond of. A plan to visit Scarborough fell through, but they went to York and saw York Minster. Poems by Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell. First edition the Brontes were at home with their father during the summer of 1845. None had any immediate prospect of employment. Charlotte found Emily's poems, which had been shared only with Anne. Charlotte said that they should be published and showed her own poems to Charlotte, and Charlotte thought that these verses too had a sweet sincere pathos of their own. The sisters eventually reached an agreement. They told nobody what they were doing. With the money from Elizabeth Branwell they paid for publication of a collection of poems, 21 from Anne and 21 from Emily and 19 from Charlotte. The book was published under pen names which retained their initials but concealed their sex. Anne's pseudonym was Acton Bell. Poems by Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell was available for sale in May 1846. 
The cost of publication was £31.10 shillings, about three quarters of Anne's salary at Thorpe Green. On May 7, 1846 the first three copies were delivered to Howarth Parsonage. The book achieved three somewhat favourable reviews, but was a commercial failure, with only two copies sold in the first year. And nonetheless found a market for her later poetry. The Leeds Intelligencer and Fraser's magazine published her poem The Narrow Way under her pseudonym in December 1848. Four months earlier, Fraser's magazine had published her poem The Three Guides. By July 1846 a package containing the manuscripts of each sister's first novel was making the rounds of London publishers. Charlotte had written The Professor, Emily had written Wuthering Heights, and Anne had written Agnes Grey. After some rejections Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey were accepted by the publisher Thomas Cautley Newby. The Professor was rejected. It was not long before Charlotte had completed her second novel, Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre was accepted immediately by Smith, Elder and Company. Duh. It was the first published of the sisters' novels, and an immediate and resounding success. Meanwhile, Anne and Emily's novels lingered in the press. Anne and Emily were obliged to pay £50 to help meet their publishing costs. Their publisher was galvanized by the success of Jane Eyre and published Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey together in December 1847. They sold well, but Agnes Grey was outshone by Emily's more dramatic Wuthering Heights. Title page of the first edition, 1848 Title page of the first American edition, 1848 Sick of Mankind and Their Disgusting Ways, scribbled in brawny and pencil at the back of her prayer book. Stevie Davis, Introduction in the Tenet of Wildfell Hall, Penguin Classics. Anne's second novel, The Tenet of Wildfell Hall, was published in the last week of June 1848. It is easy to underestimate the extent to which the novel challenged the social and legal structures. In 1913 May Sinclair said that the slamming of Helen Huntingdon's bedroom door against her husband reverberated throughout Victorian England. In the book Helen has left her husband to protect their son from his influence. She supports herself and her son in hiding by painting. She has violated social conventions and English law. Until the Married Women's Property Act 1870 was passed, a married woman had no legal existence independent from her husband and could not own property nor sue for divorce nor control the custody of her children. Helen's husband had a right to reclaim her and charge her with kidnapping. By subsisting on her own income she was stealing her husband's property since this income was legally his. And stated her intentions in the second edition, published in August 1848. She presented a forceful rebuttal to critics who considered her portrayal of Huntingdon overly graphic and disturbing. And wished to tell the truth. She explained further that when we have to do with vice and vicious characters, I maintain it is better to depict them as they really are than as they would wish to appear. To represent a bad thing in its least offensive light is doubtless the most agreeable course for a writer of fiction to pursue, but is it the most honest, or the safest? Is it better to reveal the snares and pitfalls of life to the young and thoughtless traveller, or to cover them with branches and flowers? A reader. If there were less of this delicate concealment of facts, this whispering peace. Peace, when there is no peace, there would be less of sin and misery to the young of both sexes who are left to wring their bitter knowledge from experience. And also castigated reviewers who speculated on the sex of authors and the perceived appropriateness of their writing. She was satisfied that if a book is a good one, it is so whatever the sex of the author may be. All novels are or should be written for both men and women to read, and I am at a loss to conceive how a man should permit himself to write anything that would be really disgraceful to a woman or why a woman should be censured for writing anything that would be proper and becoming for a man. The offices of Smith, Elder and Company. At No. 65 Cornhill in July 1848 Anne and Charlotte went to Charlotte's publisher George Smith in London to dispel the rumour that the Bell brothers were one person. Emily refused to go. Anne and Charlotte spent several days with Smith. Many years after Anne's death, he wrote in the Cornhill magazine his impressions of her, a gentle, quiet, rather subdued person, by no means pretty, yet of a pleasing appearance. Her manner was curiously expressive of a wish for protection and encouragement, a kind of constant appeal which invited sympathy. The increasing popularity of the Bell's works led to renewed interest in poems by Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell, originally published by Eilat and Jones. The remaining print run was bought by Smith and Elder, and reissued under new covers in November 1848. It still sold poorly. Branwell's persistent drunkenness disguised the decline of his health and he died on September 24, 1848. His sudden death shocked the family. 
He was 31. The cause was recorded as chronic bronchitis, marasmus, but was probably tuberculosis. The family suffered from coughs and colds during the winter of 1848, and Emily became very ill. She worsened over two months and rejected medical aid until the morning of 19th of December. She was very weak and said that if you will send for a doctor, I will see him now. But Emily died at about two o'clock that afternoon, age 30. Emily's death deeply affected Anne. Her grief undermined her physical health. Over Christmas and had influenza. Her symptoms intensified and in early January her father sent for a Leeds physician. The doctor diagnosed advanced consumption with little hope of recovery. And met the news with characteristic determination and self-control. However, in her letter to Ellen Nussey she expressed her frustrated ambitions, I have no horror of death, if I thought it inevitable I think I could quietly resign myself to the prospect, but I wish it would please God to spare me not only for Papa's and Charlotte's sakes but because I long to do some good in the world before I leave it. I have many schemes in my head for future practice, humble and limited indeed, but still I should not like them all to come to nothing, and myself to have lived to so little purpose. But God's will be done. Unlike Emily, and took all the recommended medicines and followed the advice she was given. That same month she wrote her last poem, A Dreadful Darkness Closes In, in which she deals with being terminally ill. Her health fluctuated for months, but she grew thinner and weaker. And Bronnie's grave at Scarborough. The flowering plants have now been replaced by a slab. And seemed somewhat better in February. She decided to visit Scarborough to see if the change of location and the fresh sea air might benefit her. Charlotte was initially against the journey, fearing that it would be too stressful, but changed her mind after the doctor's approval and Anne's assurance that it was her last hope. On May 24, 1849 and set off for Scarborough with Charlotte and Ellen Nussey. They spent a day and night in York en route. Here they escorted Anne in a wheelchair and did some shopping and visited York Minster. It was clear that Anne had little strength left. Memorial slab lying on the grave of Anne Bronnie on Sunday 27th of May and asked Charlotte whether it would be easier to return home and die instead of remaining in Scarborough. A doctor was consulted the next day and said that death was close and received the news quietly. She expressed her love and concern for Ellen and Charlotte, and whispered for Charlotte to take courage. And died at about two o'clock in the afternoon on Monday, May 28, 1849, aged 29. Charlotte decided to lay the flower where it had fallen. So Anne was buried in Scarborough. The funeral was held on 30th of May. Patrick Brownie could not have made the 70-mile journey if he had wished to. The former schoolmistress at Rowhead, Miss Wooler, was in Scarborough and she was the only other mourner at Anne's funeral. Anne was buried in St. Mary's churchyard, beneath the castle walls and overlooking the bay. Charlotte commissioned a stone to be placed over her grave with the inscription, Here lie the remains of Anne Brawny, daughter of the Reverend P. Brawny, incumbent of Howarth, Yorkshire. She died aged 28 of May 28, 1849. When Charlotte visited the grave three years later she discovered multiple errors on the headstone and had it refaced. But this was not free of error. For Anne was 29 when she died, not 28 as written. In 2011 the Brawny Society installed a new plaque at Anne Brawny's grave. The original gravestone had become illegible at places and could not be restored. It was left undisturbed while the new plaque was laid horizontally, interpreting the fading words of the original and correcting its error. In April 2013 the Brawny Society held a dedication and blessing service at the gravesite to mark the installation of the new plaque. After Anne's death Charlotte addressed issues with the first edition of Agnes Grey for its republication, but she prevented republication of the tenant of Wildfell Hall. In 1850 Charlotte wrote that Wildfell Hall it hardly appears to me desirable to preserve. The choice of subject in that work is a mistake, it was too little consonant with the character, tastes, and ideas of the gentle, retiring inexperienced writer. Subsequent critics paid less attention to Anne's work and some dismissed her as a brawny without genius but since the mid-20th century her life and works have been given better attention. Biographies by Winifred Giron and Elizabeth Langland and Edward Chitham, as well as Juliet Barker's group biography, The Brontes, and work by critics such as Inga Stina Eubank. Marianne Thormallen, Laura C. Berry, Jan B. Gordon, Mary Summers, and Juliet McMaster has led to acceptance of Anne Bronte as a major literary figure. Sally MacDonald of the Bronte Society said in 2013 that in some ways Anne is now viewed as the most radical of the sisters, writing about tough subjects such as women's need to maintain independence and how alcoholism can tear a family apart. 
In 2016 Lucy Mangan championed Anne Brondi in the BBC's Being the Brondies, declaring that her time has come. Thanks for watching.